I wanted to tell you again about the trunk or treat and the chili cook off. It is a, a, a staff deacon cook off. So you need to be encouraging some of our deacons to make sure they follow the rules. Okay, your wives may not make the chili for you, nor may Hormel or whoever else. What about mothers? No. You have to make your own chili. Okay. I'm making sure everybody else is. Got to make your own chili, but it's going to be a lot of fun. I hope you'll plan on being there. We'll eat first and do the trunk or treat. Uh, and I would encourage you to make a trunk. You know, you don't have to be in a competition. Uh, my trunk's very simple. I just want to be a part of it and uh, see kids and celebrate that and love on some kids. So uh, make sure you're thinking about that. That's in two weeks, five to seven Sunday night. It will be. And, of course, we won't have worship here. We'll be doing that and spending time fellowshipping and rejoicing for um, the trunk or treat. I want to share with you from 1 Corinthians 13, very well-known passage. Um, we never can hear it enough. I will show you the most excellent way, Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. And he defines it. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others, is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Let's pray together. Father, we do love you, but we pray that you would purify our love. We pray that you would test it and examine it and... Um, intensify it and put it centered completely on you and on your will and your purpose and your word and your glory. Because we know, God, if we could learn to love you with everything we have, then every other part of us would just fall right into place with that. We wouldn't have near as much a problem loving other people. We wouldn't have near a problem loving people that we uh, live with, that we go to church with. We wouldn't even have a problem loving people that are different from us or um, give us a, a discomfort or cause us to be confused. We wouldn't even have a problem loving people who are our enemies. We know this is true because Jesus told us we should love our enemies and do good to those who persecute you. Help us to know you and love you with our whole hearts. Help us to love with the purest devotion in our relationships with other people. And Lord, we pray uh, for that kind of spirit and that kind of attitude in this church. That you would bless us. That you would point us outward and not inward upon ourselves. To be dedicated to other people and care for them. And reach out to them. And help us to fulfill the call that you've given us. Thank you. Thank you more than anything. For how you love us. We couldn't even fathom what life in this world would be like. Without the love of God and the love of Christ in our lives. Lord bless our time here tonight. Speak and move and be glorified in your church. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Let's sing about it on page 243. Stand and worship.
him with many crowns one day he's not we're not gonna do it the father's gonna crown him with many crowns because he is the one worthy page 161 let's crown him with many crowns
Thank you, Sherry Lynn. Thank you, Robert. Where'd he go? You don't get to leave the, lead the music and then take off. Robert. He's gone. Oh, yes, right, right. Where the ice cream is, I'm sure. <laughs> it is hot in here. The AC's not working. Um, keep your neighbor awake, okay? And uh, we'll see what the Lord's got to say to us, and it'll be all right. 1 Kings chapter 15 is where we're headed, 1 Kings 15. Uh, I didn't bring any copies of the chart. I'm sure some of you need it since I've... I only gave it out for the first time last time, but I'll get some more of these. If you're looking at your chart, you remember one side is the kings of Judah. That's the southern kingdom, Jerusalem, the capital. And the other side is the kings of Israel. That's the northern kingdom. You'll recall they kind of go in tandem. And it's a challenge as you're working through First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles because it, it skips back and forth. And if you have a long king in the north, you might have four or five kings in the south through that time. And we follow a timeline, but it does go back and forth. Today we're looking at the second king in Israel. So Jeroboam was the first king, and then his son Nadab is the second king. And it tells you 1 Kings 15, 25 through 31 is the passage about Nadab. You might recall that I, I've mentioned to you there are several kings in the north who served just a very short period of time. Um, Nadab is one of them. His reign is two years. Um, and he's one of the longer of the shorters. So some of them serve a month or two. Some of them serve a week or two as the king. Nadab actually gets two years. Uh, and that's pretty impressive compared to those who only get to be king for a week or so. So uh, he is the son of Jeroboam. He became the king in Israel in Asa's second year. Asa is the king in the south. This is approximately 909 B.C. And that matches with the timeline that you have on the chart that I've given you. Let's look at the passages. A couple of places where Nadab is mentioned. One is just in the chronology. And then the second passage just gives a real brief story about Nadab. 1 Kings 14 is where I want to start in one verse, verse 20, 1 Kings 14, 20. Um, <clears throat> he reigned 22 years, that's Jeroboam, and then he rested with his ancestors, and Nadab his son succeeded him as king. The next, next passage skips to the south and covers Rehoboam, and then the beginning of chapter 15 covers Abijah, who um, follows Rehoboam in the south, and then Asa follows Abijah in the south, and then 1525 jumps back to the north and gives us the, the total story about Nadab, which is just four or five verses. So 1 Kings 15, 25, Nadab, son of Jeroboam, became king of Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah. And he reigned over Israel two years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the ways of his father, Jeroboam, and committing the same sins that his father has caused Israel to commit. And Basha, son of Ahijah, from the tribe of Issachar, plotted against him, and he struck him down at Gibbethon, a Philistine town, while Nadab and all Israel were besieging it. So they're in battle formation. They're besieging one of the towns of the Philistines, which is the natural enemy of the Israelites. And while they're in this kind of battle scenario, one of the Israelites kills the king of Israel. Uh, in that particular framework. And he becomes the next king. And he'll be um, the next one that we'll be discussing. Basha. Uh, verse 28 says, Basha killed Nadab in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, and succeeded him as king. Um, as soon as he began to reign, he killed Jeroboam's whole family. So Nadab's one of Jeroboam's sons. Basha wiped out all of them. He did not leave Jeroboam, anyone that breathed, but destroyed them all. And get this phrase, according to the word of the Lord given through his servant Ahijah the Shilonite. 
This happened because of the sins Jeroboam had committed and caused Israel to commit and because he aroused the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel. As for the other events of Nadab's reign and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? There was war between Asa and Basha, which had continued between Asa and Nadab and continued between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the way up to this point. They fought and they fought. Southern Kingdom, Northern Kingdom. As uh, brief as the description is, there is a lot that we can learn here about Nadab and apply it in our own lives and in our own time and in our own country and in the world today. And I want to do that and give you just some of the lessons that uh, stand out to me in this passage. One of them is the simple lesson of national instability. National instability. Look at your list of kings of Israel and you see the evaluation column and you will notice if you just look down the column quickly your eye is trained to find variation or difference, something that stands out and in that column nothing stands out. There's one statement and it is repeated about every single king in the northern kingdom of Israel. Did evil, did evil. And that's exactly the phrase that's used in scripture uh, to talk about these kings. That's a phrase we have to talk about again and again and again. These were all failures in the eyes of God. And they all suffered in various ways in that sense. And so uh, there was continuous animosity, difficulty, problems, strain. The nation of Israel suffered greatly. And the passage tells us here it's because of the initial sin of Jeroboam. You might remember a couple of weeks ago when Jeroboam was made king and we talked about him that Sunday night and God told Jeroboam, if you will do these things, if you will live in a biblical mindset, if you will honor me with your life, if you will lead the people to be faithful, then I will bless you and you will never cease to have someone on the throne in Israel, the northern kingdom. That's a great promise, right? I mean, to me, I would lock into that as best I could. God's going to bless me, bless my prosperity after me, bless my name and do this great thing to bring peace and harmony and hope and opportunity to the nation that God has given me. But even by the time of Jeroboam's very first successor, Nadab, it's too late. It's already over. The sin has piled up so high. So this environment of national instability, the nation's just roiling all the time. It's turning over all the time. It's uh, all kinds of internal strife and difficulty and problems and pain. Imagine what it would be like to live in a nation like that. And we look at the condition of our nation today and we see all kinds of things that make us pretty mad. It makes me mad to see what, what is being done in the name of our government, what's being done by people who were never elected. I'm not sure that the elected people are the worst people, if you know what I mean. I think you have career folks who have agendas and they have the power and they pretty much do whatever they want to do. And the people that we elect to carry out uh, um, agendas, purposes that we believe in, they don't really get to establish what they say they're going to do if they have the integrity to actually do what they say they're going to do. So I, I get where we are as a nation, but I'm going to tell you something. We as a nation have had more stability than just about any nation the world has ever seen. Just about any nation at all. Our constitution hasn't changed. Even though we don't keep it very well, and I'm pretty sure most everybody in this room, you're like me, um, I love and believe in the Constitution. I think it's one of the greatest documents that man has ever come up with, and I don't really think it's just something that man came up with. I think it was something that God inspired and blessed and used for the expansion of the gospel. This nation's been the greatest mission-sending nation that the world's ever seen, the greatest nation for the advancement of Christianity. We've... Um, experienced great blessing we might say it's even something similar to what God said to Jeroboam if you will move in this direction and do these things I will bless you and we've seen God's blessing in this nation we've had times where this nation has fallen on its face before God and called out 
for a repentance and for salvation and for a new hope, a new opportunity. We've seen that in several cases in our history. My, how much we need that again today, by the way. But we have had tremendous instability, um, tremendous stability as a nation compared to everything else in the world. What if we had to face a coup every decade? You know what a coup is. It's what Bashar did here. He sneaks up behind the king. He wipes out the king. He takes the crown, put his own, puts it on his head and says, hey, I'm the guy now. You know, I'm in charge now. And it's a new nation. It's a new leader. It's a, a new set of principles and laws and purposes. What if that happened every 10 years or so? I mean, it would be tough to live in that kind of environment. We would never know about our long-term future. We'd be kind of terrified all the time, kind of worried all the time, wondering what we're going to do and how we're going to make it. What if we had to scrap the Constitution every 10 years and write another one? I listened to some of those guys on the radio, and they're talking about a new um, constitutional congress. We do have the, this privilege under our constitution to, to rehash it or come up with some new ideas. And if we got this many states to have con um, congressional conventions, and they would talk about ideas for a new constitution, and these guys on the radio are like, we need to do this and do it better. And I'm going, no, no. I don't know of anybody, especially a large group of people, that I'm going to trust to try and do it any better. I don't think we want a new constitution. I think what we've got, we need to preserve and keep it safe. France has had no fewer than 17 constitutions in 200 years. 17 constitutions in 200 years. And if you do your math, that's almost one every 10 years. Over and over, they rewrite the Constitution. That's tremendous instability. The Dominican Republic has had 32 constitutions. It's like you have to wake up in the morning and read the newspaper to find out which laws are being carried out today and which people are favored by those laws and which people are targeted by those laws. China has had 13 coups since 1860. Now, not since the um, Maoist revolution has taken place, but th that was one of the coups. But they've had 13 coups since 1860. Greece has had 18 in about that same period of time. Coups where new governments come in. You know, they shut down the newspaper or the radio or the television stations and they send squads of armed goons and they run out the current government and now we're in charge around here. That does sound like a great new opportunity, right? Doesn't that sound exciting? No, it sounds horrible. Of course, you know who has the record for new governments and it's a nation that is close geographically to the United States. It's Haiti. You wouldn't want to live in Haiti. It seems like it would be a real uh, challenge and a real um, danger zone. Uh, they have a coup every five years or so, it seems, one after the other. Here's one sure thing. Lots of people have died in each turnover, each coup that is violently held. And a violent uprising, there's military clashes and the army or whatever the, the army looks like, they have to decide what side they're going to be on and they fight it out or they give up real fast. Uh, but it's always going to be bloody. It's always going to be destructive. And there's another thing too, um, you can certainly see that we as a nation have been a blessed nation. The United States has definitely been a blessed nation. Um, <clears throat> anybody with half a brain can see that. And anybody today who wants to go off on how horrible this nation is, all they're showing you is they don't even have half a brain. All you got to do is make some comparisons, okay? All you got to do is read true history, not made up history. And it's just astounding to me that the smartest people in the room, supposedly, are the ones that are so easily fooled and confused by reality. Yes, there are always problems. Yes, this nation's not perfect. I get that. Of course we're not perfect. It's made up of sinful people. But it sure is a great, blessed, and incredible place. And there's no way to look at it if you're looking at the truth and say, surely God is doing something, has done something 
through these people in this place. We have definitely been a blessed nation. I think I've told you this statistic before, um, but it really had shocked me, and, and I use it all the time uh, anymore. But if you added up all of humanity uh, for all of the history of the planet, less than 5% of everybody who has ever lived has lived in a free society. The way we understand freedom. Less than 5%. 95% of all the people who have ever lived has lived under dictatorial totalitarianism. That means you don't know when the troops are coming down your road and taking your kids away and you never see them again. That means you don't know when the slave owners show up. Slavery is all over the world. I just heard a week or two ago there are more slaves right now in the world than there were uh, before 1865 when slavery uh, ended in the United States, 1863-64, that time frame. So uh, you can learn from Nabab, Nadab this whole idea of national instability and be reminded that we are blessed and we should feel pretty good about that, but we should also be praying pretty hard. I was talking with someone just this week. If you want to know how to pray for a leader, pray for a man or a woman with character. Okay, I don't have to put any names on you. I don't have to tell you about a Democratic Party or a Republican Party. If you pray for somebody who believes the truth, who knows the truth, who will stand for the truth and tell the truth, then you've got somebody that's worthy to be a leader. A leader, somebody with character. Uh, incidentally, I don't see too many of those kind of people. Especially in the advertisements and with the titles and driving the giant automobiles with all the um, protection that they have. I don't see too many people with character. I don't know where they are. I think the, the media attacks have so terrified people with character they don't want to be in the middle of, of the slime that's become our political system. Pray for somebody with character to be a leader that God would raise them up. That would wind up being a pretty good person, I think. Here's the second thing we can learn from Nabab. Uh, your sin will find you out. Your sin, your sin... Not talking about somebody else's sin. Your sin will find you out. You need to know or be reminded. Um, after Jeroboam, the northern, northern kingdom is on a downward trajectory. Every king is evil. The chart makes that plain. The text in the Bible makes it doubly plain. And the nation is on a downward spiral all the way to the end when the Assyrians show up in 722 and they are no more. Your sin will find you out. God told Jeroboam, I'm going to tear ten of the tribes away from Solomon. Uh, not in Solomon's life, but when Rehoboam takes over. And Jeroboam, I'm going to give you ten tribes. And I will do something great if you will allow me to. But instead, Jeroboam, his sin rose to the top. Jeroboam wanted to be like the rest of the world. And he chose to use world philosophy to lead the people. And what he did was destroy the people. He destroyed the nation and he destroyed his own family. Uh, while in the southern kingdom, Judah, um, the line of David continued for thousands of years till we got to the Messiah. That was the promise of God. The line of Jeroboam was Jeroboam and Nadab. And that's it. Bashah came in after that and he is the hand of God's judgment. And, Jer and Jeroboam's family is gone. All of them, every single one of them. So specifically, it says in the text that uh, the sins of Jeroboam uh, are perpetuated in the life of the northern kingdom. Even after Nadab, we're going to be told about the sins of Jeroboam, the sins of Jeroboam, the sins of Jeroboam. And each successive king, not sons, grandsons of Jeroboam, but still in the pattern of Jeroboam, are judged for the sins of Jeroboam. Boam, and their sin always will find them out. So specifically it says in 1526 uh, of Nadab, he was walking in the ways of his father and in his sin which he had caused Israel to commit. 
The Bible is very clear on this principle. It is again and again in numerous passages. In Numbers 32, 23, Israel is preparing to enter into the promised land and conquer the land and take what God has promised to them. And Joshua is challenging the people. Here's what you said you would do. Here's what God told you to do. And you need to do it. And then verse 23, Numbers 32, If you fail to do this, you will be sinning against the Lord and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. Sin has a price attached to it. And the price is always exacted. There is no way to get around it. This is the great tragedy, the great horror, the great travesty of human existence. We are all sinners. And as we perpetuate the sin, embrace the sin, love the sin, make excuses for the sin, all we're doing is building a mountain of consequences for ourselves that someday will come due. You can pay those yourself or Christ Jesus can pay them for you. If you place your faith in Jesus, he has paid the price for those sins. Not the consequences now. If you mess up and go to jail, becoming a Christian won't get you out of jail. It seems these days becoming a Christian makes you more likely to go to jail. That's kind of how it was in the first century in the lifetime of Paul and the apostles. All of them died a martyr's death. John lived on the Isle of Patmos and lived a long life. Uh, but he lived as a, an exile, a martyr, even himself. So there is this idea of the suffering and the, the difficulty. But what is seen here in the life of Nadab is the intense judgment of God. And the price that is paid. The most famous verse for all of this you know well. Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. Which sin? All sin. How many sins? Even just one sins. The bad sins are the minor sins, Pastor. All of the sins, no matter what those sins are. The good people's sins are the really evil people's sins. Everybody's sins. All the time, everybody sins. And it also is not just exclusively individuals. Okay, there can be situations where a family becomes j just painted with this idea of sin. And it bleeds in to the life of that family. Or a business is ruined because the business has um, attached itself to, to principles and values that are personally destructive and, and morally reprehensible. Or a nation can reject God like we see happening specifically here and turn its heart, its life, and its focus in the wrong direction. And someday the hand of God is going to rise up against that nation. Nations rise, nations fall. And God's judgment comes. Your sin will find you out. The point really is that Nadab didn't even attempt to do anything to get Israel back to God. He had no interest in that, no desire to do that at all. He continued what daddy did, and that was to push the nation away from God. Quite simply, sin has a price. That price will be paid. Another one of my favorites is in um, Galatians. And you probably, if you've been around me enough, you've heard me say this at one time as well. Be not deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And a woman reaps what she sows. When you invest your life one way, you're going to get back what that way produces. No matter what it is. If you're invested in the things of God, then you receive back the blessing of God. If you invest in the world and reject God's plan and pattern and the fruit He wants to produce, then you receive the curse of this world. Nadab got it. He really did. Here's the third thing, though, that, that brings this even more to the forefront. Sometimes the payment for sin comes quickly. Quickly. How long did Nadab get to be king? Two years. And his father was king for 17 years. 17 years. So I kind of think about he's probably in his 20s, um, Jeroboam, when he took over, and he reigned for 20 years, so Nadab might be 20, 25, 30 years old, and he's got two years on the throne, and he's wiped out. 
So he's, he's in his 30s, I would say, something like that. I'm just extrapolating the line. The scripture never really tells us exactly. But he's a young guy. He dies young. He dies quick. He dies at the height of what he would call his glory. I'm the king of Israel. Here we are in battle scenario. We've got this Philistine city besieged. So obviously at some point they're going to lay down and we've defeated them. Great victory. Isn't this wonderful? Ah, it's good to be king and that's the end of that and it's over you see every sin has a price and sometimes the price comes quickly sometimes you pay it before you even get out of it it's amazing how many people um, we've seen who have like secret sin in their lives and they think nobody knows and they think it's okay, and they keep kind of pressing back into that until there it is. It's out, it's revealed, it's discovered, and the judgment falls so fast. And all of the visible positive things that were there, they're gone. The legacy's gone, the character of that person is gone, the fruit of that person is destroyed. And it all comes Quickly, listen to Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. There were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. Here this phrase is, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Second Peter 2, bringing swift destruction on themselves. God doesn't always just hang back and watch us mess up and kind of say, oh man, I sure wish Tracy could, could get this straightened out. Okay, sometimes it's just immediate. Sometimes it happens now. Sometimes it is swift and immediate. And in this case, he's talking about false teachers and false prophets who are bringing swift destruction on themselves. Another great example of this is uh, in Luke 12. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. Uh, you'll uh, identify this passage quickly once you uh, see where we are. This is the rich fool he's been called uh, for so many um, centuries. Luke 12, 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Money, I want my money. Jesus, you be the money man. And Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? And he said, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Then he told them the parable. The ground of a certain man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. He thinks he's had an aha moment. I will tear down my barns. I will build bigger barns. I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty. Isn't it wonderful? Grain laid up for years and years and years. I got this big giant fat retirement account. I've got all the money I could ever want. I've got it so much better off than anybody else. And he makes this statement, eat, drink, and be merry. Man, life is great. And what does it say in the very next verse? God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. And who will get what you have prepared for yourselves? This very night your end has come that's a stark reminder right none of us ever knows when our end is coming we never know what's going to happen or how things are going to go and this is not so much speaking about this man falling under judgment but just the fact that his focus wasn't in the right place he was loving all the wrong stuff and he put himself in the position where he's dreaming this great dream for the future but he has no future this event is coming upon him. And the last verse says, This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Sometimes the judgment of sin is swift and immediate. It 
falls in on you fast. We all know how this works, right? We maybe have experienced it in our own lives or we've seen other people where everything seems to be rolling along smoothly. Everything's happening well. We feel good about whatever's going on and the, and the pendulum swings, the hammer falls and everything in that life changes overnight. Instantly. And you're left going, my gosh, what, what is this? What's happened? What do I do? How do I deal with this? And So I just want this point, this understanding to get into our minds and hearts with a sense of, of anticipation that we prepare ourselves. Not just the idea of, of your sin and swift judgment of sin, but how quickly anything can change. You can't trust in anything in this world. All you can trust in is that God's got his hand in your life and he will preserve you to the end even if your end is tomorrow. And if that's the Lord's will and design for me, so be it. That's the way we have to think. Whatever God plans and intends, that's what we desire. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. And then Paul, writing to the Corinthians, quotes Isaiah, and he says, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. A anything you want to do that's right and good and true and called of God to do, do it, you know, do it as quickly as you can. Do it with everything that you've got. And understand, anything you've got going going on behind the scenes that's against God repent of it and do it today do it now as quickly as you can and as with much passion as you might have great story about D.L. Moody and what I think was a was a massive point of of change and empowerment in his tremendous ministry D.L. Moody was preaching in Chicago it was Sunday night October the 8th 1871 any any historian in here know what that date was Randy Martin, do you know what that day was? I'm going to test you every Sunday night. You better start reading your history and get ready. I'm going to tell you what it was. He's preaching. Say it. There you go. Good job. He was preaching to the largest congregation to date he had ever had in his church. And the text was, what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? Matthew 27, 22. And so he preached. He shared the gospel. At the conclusion of his sermon, he said, I wish you would take this text home with you. Turn it over in your minds during the week. And next Sabbath, we will come to Calvary and the cross. And we will decide what to do with Jesus of Nazareth. Take it home. Study it. Pray over it. Next Saturday... We'll talk about how to respond to Jesus. So Ira Sankey sang these words after that. Uh, Today the Savior calls for refuge fly. The storm of justice falls and death is nigh. So you could die any moment, but y'all go home, come back next Sunday and we'll talk about how to be saved. And while they were singing that song, the bells in the city started ringing because the great Chicago fire had already started while they were still at church. That was the night. It burned for three days. It killed almost 300 people. And it destroyed 3.3 square miles of Chicago. Including Moody's church in Chicago. So later Moody said, I have never since dared to give an audience a week to think about their salvation. You do not know what's going to happen tonight or tomorrow or any other time. You must understand this idea of timeliness and the prescience, the, the significance of now, right now. We got to get to this now. And I know we talk about praying for family members or um, processing an event or a call of God, preparing for things, understanding and, and uh, letting things grow and develop. But we also have to understand there's a point where it's now or never. It's now or never. It could be the, the falling hand of God in judgment. I need to fix this before that happens. It could be the need for somebody you're going to see tomorrow who needs to hear Jesus. And maybe God's telling you, you've got to say more than just, I'll pray for you. It'll be okay. 
I, I, I trust the Lord, you should trust Him too. Maybe God's telling you, now's the time. This is the day. I need to follow through and express it. Let me tell you more of what He said. Uh, if they were lost, they might rise up in judgment against me. I have never seen that congregation since. The church is gone. They never had the follow-up. I will never meet those people until I meet them in another world. But I want to tell you of one lesson that I learned that night, which I have never forgotten, and that is when I preach to press Christ upon the people then and there and try to bring them to a decision on the spot. I would rather have my right hand cut off than to give an audience a week now to decide what to do with Jesus you got to remember you do not know you do not know the timing in God's plan you never know it you've just got to be available and you've got to at some point say Lord at the moment you tell me to go I'm going at the moment you put me on my knees in brokenness I'm repenting I'll name the sin and I'll rip it out of my life I've got to respond and respond powerfully and immediately to it. One more lesson I want to get out of the life of Nadab. This is number four, I think. Leaders have a great responsibility. I want this to be just as personal as it should be, though. Because every single one of you are leaders. Every single one of you. Yes, Nadab's the king. I understand. That's a different category. I've never been the king of anything. I'm not even the king of Julie. You know, I have a hard enough time just being the king of Tracy. So I, I get it. That's not what I'm talking about. But we have people around us who are watching us. We have people around us who God has placed around us because we are the best opportunity for that person to, to see the truth, to understand the, the, the fragrance of Christ, and to recognize the value of Christianity. Every single one of us, you have an influence factor. You have people that are around you. And we've got to recognize whatever we do is speaking up or down to them all the time. All the time. You're either drawing them closer to Christ or you're pushing them in the wrong direction. So passages like James 3.1, which is where we will be next Sunday morning. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. That basically means if you want to speak for Jesus, you better make sure you're speaking the truth. Don't say something to razzle-dazzle somebody that you don't have a true biblical basis for. Don't say something, you know, just because you've got an idea or you want to say you had a vision. Um, God doesn't do that anymore the way he did it in the Bible. Okay, He doesn't give you visions of revelation of new truth. The truth he's given us is what we have in this book and it's preserved and codified in this book so that we can know that it's true and all agree that it's true. If you come up with a new idea and the rest of your church says that's crazy, um, that probably means you don't really know what you're talking about. You've got to be careful as a leader that you don't influence people in the wrong direction. This is one of the serious prayers in my own life in, in, the, in the great effort I uh, invest in trying to be a decent pastor. Don't let me say something stupid. That's part of my prayer life. Now, I know I get kind of goofy sometimes and silly and ridiculous and, you know, that's part of my personality. But I don't want to say something that would in any way confuse the truth of Christ in anybody's life at any point. And all of us need to be in that same mindset. How can I be faithful to the word and how can I represent it well to other people? Nadab, um, he not only fell himself, but it says he led all Israel, all Israel to do this sin and to fall in this same way. It's in verse 26. He did it, this 1 Corinthians 15. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Following the ways of his father. Committing the same sin his father had caused Israel to commit. So they'd failed uh, entirely. As those trying to represent the truth. Back in 1 Kings 14. Verses 9 and 10. This is what Ahijah the prophet said to Jeroboam's wife you have done more evil than all who lived before you 
You have made for yourself other gods, idols made of metal. You have provoked me to anger and thrust me behind your back. Because of this, I am going to bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam. I will cut off from Jeroboam every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will burn up the house of Jeroboam as one burns dung until it is all gone. So he pronounces this judgment on Jeroboam because of the 17-year sin record of Jeroboam this is about 910 when Jeroboam died and so all the way back to 722 what is that 188 years about 188 years uh, Israel is on this continuous decline and it's all because of the influence of this first king this first leader who set the trajectory downward constantly and judgment falls and judgment falls and judgment falls but you know why God brings judgment so that those who see it might make some kind of change in their lives they might be con converted and then be conformed to the truth of God and how many times maybe that you and I see God trying to send a signal trying to get your attention uh, and he, he, he brings judgment here or he brings discipline here or he brings a persecution over here and he's trying to wake us up and cause us to be, to be holy, to be aware, to be committed, to love him the way we should. So I think just reading the kings, Nadab, very, uh, very limited bit of information. But boy, there's a lot to learn there, right? And a lot of questions we need to be asking about ourselves and how we're living faithfully. And whether God's going to be able to use us and bless us and bless the people around us. Let's pray. Father, we do ask for a new understanding, deeper understanding of ourselves. Each one of us here, we, we struggle and fight with sin issues. Please don't ever let us deny that. Cause us to see it and to be real about it and repent. Each one of us here, Lord, we need to understand the, the, the great consequences, the travesty of sin and how it harms but also uh, not just us but how it harms the people around us we pray for your blessing we pray for you to open our hearts we pray for the fresh wind of the spirit the gentle work of Christ in our hearts and then in in our influence in our relationships our families in our church Lord allow us to be a blessing to other people Allow us to be the church that you've called us to be. But make it right. Make things right in our lives and show us what those things are that need to change and need to be refocused for your glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Would you just remain in a spirit of prayer and take a minute or two and tell the Lord what you want to do, what you mean, what you desire. Maybe it's somebody you're thinking about that you want to really have a positive influence. Maybe it's something you know that needs to be spoken or expressed and needs to be quickly, hasty. Maybe there's an issue that you need to repent of and overcome in your life. Let the Lord reveal that to you during this time. Sherilyn, can I ask, would you close us in prayer tonight, please?